Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater Adventure. Hello and welcome to Adventure Bike TV and we're going to start off with some good news. Joe Farmer have come on board as a new sponsor. Now they're going to be sponsoring our top riding tips which will be starting next month. But as always we'll be starting with the bike review and uh, Tom's gone behind my back and got somebody else to do it this month. Our panniers have a double thick rim at the base, keeping damage from the inevitable bumps, scrapes and offs to the outside of the pannier. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Okay, so I bought myself a Royal Enfield Himalayan. A uh, few of you all know a little bit about this bike, uh, just trying to explain the details. It's a 411cc engine producing 24.5 brake horsepower and 32 newton meters of, tor of torque, 5 speed gearbox, steel frame, 21 inch front wheel, 17 inch rear, ABS, uh, uh, fuel injection, and that basically is about it. There's not much else to talk about other than the £4,000 price tag. And I think that's probably why I bought the bike. You know, at £4,000 when they announced the bike, I thought it's never going to come out at that price. It's going to go up, it's going to be 45, 47, 48. You know, when you've got CRF 250Ls for 46 now, V-Strom 250s for 46, BMW G310 GSs like Graham Road last issue for 51, 52, and the CRF Rally for 54, you always thought this is a bike that's going to be in the mid fours to late fours. So when it came out and it was 399 plus 200 on the road, I thought, I'm intrigued by it. I'm gonna buy one, I'm gonna run it for the year, and I'm gonna see how it goes. You know, as we say, it's a very basic bike. There's not much to talk about it, other than probably the bad introduction it had when it came out in India two years ago. Now, when it launched in India, in, I think it was sort of like February 2016, it's fair to say it was plagued by problems. It got problems uh, with the wiring, with the coil, with the head bearings, with the, with pretty much everything. They had a lot of issues with it. And then, back then it was called the BS3. Now about a year after it came out, the Royal Enfield went back sort of to the drawing board and made 38 changes to it, as well as replacing the carburetor with fuel injection. This gave us the BS4 model, which is what we're getting in the UK. Uh, we also get ABS fitted to it to make it Euro, um, e, Euro 4 compliant. But essentially what we've got is the second generation Himalayan. I guess fundamentally what sold it to me was the price. Now, I think with the adventure sector, it is really starting, personally speaking, it's starting to get carried away with itself. You know, when we've got 800cc bikes coming in at 12 grand, and we've got the 1200cc bikes, the GS and the like, and the Triumph Explorer coming in at 16, 17, 18, the Multistrada Enduro at 19,000 pounds. Now, in a sense, that's gone too far. That's adventure taken to too far and extreme. So for me, for a bike to come in at four grand, to be basic, to offer the fundamental packages of wheels, engine, and suspension, and it, let's be honest, it's designed for India. If it can cope with India, then it should be able to cope with UK trails. So that's what we're here today to find out. Just do a few trails around uh, Warwickshire, Worcestershire, and uh, see if I've wasted four grand or not. go through a few of the basics really so starting with the brakes I mean we've got a single disc up front 300 mil disc with twin uh, pop caliper single disc at the rear 240 mil disc so quite basic brakes really it's got ABS non switchable ABS which is a bit of a shame but I guess it's, it's pretty standard issue now not to have switchable ABS the brakes get some criticism online and from people who've ridden it previously but I find that they're all right you know they're, they're good enough for the performance that the bike offers They've not got a huge amount of initial bite, but if you lean on them and give them a good squeeze, they will stop you up. The back brake is a little bit sensitive. You know, you, you put a pressure and it bit of brake, but a bit more pressure, a bit more brake, and then it'll suddenly grab a little bit. 
which is probably why it's good to have ABS. So uh, the brakes are functional. Handling, you know, on the, on the road, the handling's pretty, pretty neutral, pretty well balanced, really. It doesn't turn in sharp with the 21 inch front wheel. Uh, it just rides quite stable, really. Um, good leverage from the bars, good weight distribution. The uh, Pirelli MT60 tires give enough grip. You know, obviously uh, they're a compromised tire, a hybrid tire, but they're pretty, they're pretty good for the road. Um, performance and engine, you know, we've got a single, like I say, we've got a 410cc single cylinder engine putting out 24.5 brake horsepower, which is not a lot, but then it does put out 32 newton meters of torque, which is 10 more than the Honda CRF 250. And I, know, I think you notice that it's just got a little bit more squirt, a little bit more grunt out, out of the corners. Uh, and I think so for just pottling along, you know, A and B roads doing 65, it's going to be that little bit sweeter, which is pretty much why, I, why I've gone for this over a Honda. One thing I would say, the, the seat is a little bit soft. Now, what is nice, it's an 800 millimeter seat height, which is the same as a V-Strom and about 65, sort of 75 millimeters less than a CRF and 40 millimeters less than a GS310. So it's a low seat, which is good. It's got quite a soft foam. So if you weigh probably a little bit, uh, and if you've got quite long legs and you're above six foot, you might find it a little bit cramped uh, in the leg. Uh, you know, you might look to put in a bit firmer foam uh, in the seat. But other than that, pretty good all, right, all around. So yeah, happy days. through the riding day we've done a few trails on the bike on the Himalayan I guess first impressions are that it's better than I thought I mean it's first of all it's better in the way it seems to be constructed and put together the overall product is better than I was expecting it doesn't feel cheap like a Chinese made bike might and even the low-end Japanese bikes have now got that tinny shininess that this doesn't seem to have it seems a very handmade almost uh, labor-intensive product so it seems like you get a lot for your money first and foremost. How that translates into the way it rides, well first and foremost the weight, it's about 190 wet at cur curb weight, which is quite heavy and that's always going to blunt its trail and off-road ability. I think if we were to view this bike solely as a trail bike, you'd probably, uh, it'd probably fall down a little bit compared to a CRF 250L which is 40 kilos lighter. As it is, what you've got is quite a nice package. The standing up position is quite nice, there is a little bit of flaring in the cars and I think if you've got big calves, it might be a little bit too much flare. But when you stood up, you've got a lot of space in the chest. You've got a nice position with the arms. It's well balanced. The weight is nice and slender and it's low down. So the, the bike isn't light, but it's, it's nicely packaged weight. We've got a 15 litre fuel tank, I think that's going to be plenty. Looking at a fuel range of about 70 miles per gallon is what people have been getting already on them. So you're going to, go be, you're going to have a 200 mile range, which I think that's pretty good. I also like these frames on here. Now obviously these are adding to the weight of um, 190 kilos wet. These are clearly adding to it because they're really sturdy. But what it does mean is you can nicely position some soft luggage on there, you know, a dry bag or so. Uh, it comes with a rack as standard on the back. That's going to take a, a, a dry bag really nicely. Now Royal Enfield are offering their own metal aluminium panniers and they're 500 pounds uh, available from the dealers. But I think with the basic bike of the aluminium panniers, you've got everything you need there for a travel bike. Um, also things I like, it comes with a centre stand as standard. You know, it's, they're not tubeless tyres, tubeless rims, so there's a chance you're going to have to repair a puncture. Now having a centre stand as standard is a really nice thing to have, especially if you're on a trip and you don't have access to a garage and a stand anyway. The fact that that comes inclusive of a four grand bike is, is a lesson the other manufacturers really should learn when they're charging 300 for. Other things, I think the instrument panel's quite nice. It's got a very clear speedo reading, rev counter. It's also got a compass, which is a bit of a naff gimmick, but it's, it adds a little bit of a distinctive feature to it. 
Uh, but it's got a gear indicator, temperature gauge, pretty much everything you need. And that pretty much is it. Other than that though, as a chugging day-to-day -day trail bike, which if you had panniers on and luggage, was able to do these trails, not at a fast pace, but at a steady pace to get you through, whether it's in the Himalayas or Morocco, or South America, no, it will do this all day, and it's far more competent than I think you would uh, you would think. What I also like about it, it's a it's a it's a long stroke engine, which means it's got lots of low down mid range torque. So in second gear, it's just chugging along really nicely. You know, you don't have to be up and down through the gears. It'll hold second for quite a long time, and it, it's you know it's very easy to ride on part throttle second gear. It'll do it all day long. So. I think first impressions on the trails are, it's not a trail bike, but it'll do the trails quite nicely. Okay, to summarise, I mean, I guess it's always going to be tricky when you've actually spent your own money on a bike to s look at it objectively because you're always going to try and justify the purchase you've made. Taking that into account, now my initial thoughts on the Himalayan that I bought, I've done 100 miles on it so far, a mixture of road and tarmac, road and trail even, is that it's much better than I expected. It rides better, it rides better on the road, it's very composed, the suspension deals well with bumps. And at the minute running it, in, running it in, it'll sit at 55 miles an hour, which isn't obviously high speed. But once run in, I gather they'll do about 75, 80 top speed. Now, obviously, some people are going to look at or hear those figures and laugh and say, that's not a bike for me. Which I think is where the Himalayan ultimately is going to divide people who see a point in it or a merit to it and to those who don't. And if you don't see a point in it, then nobody's ever going to convince you otherwise. Now... I like the idea of it because it is something I can use day to day, especially on, I'm doing guided tours this year, Land Centre, John O'Groats, or back roads. For a, bike, for a road like that, I think it is going to be a good bike. And riding it in the first 100 miles, I'm impressed with how it performs on those bumpy, nadgery A, B roads. And it'll easily keep up with traffic. It's got a lot of low down torque and low down pull, which is quite nice. It's not a bike that you're going to want to thrash. So, so far on the road, more than happy with it, decent. On the trails, I think it's much better and more competent than I was expecting it to be. It's not, a, as we said before, it's not a trail bike. I think anybody looking at this and saying, you know, is it an alternative to a CRF or is it an alternative to a second-hand DRZ400? It's not an alternative to either of those bikes. I'd say this is more an alternative to a G310GS like Graham rode last issue. And having ridden that bike recently, I would say a bike like that and the Versys 300, they've got more power, they've got more, they're packing more heat to, to, to them as bikes. Are they as good travel bikes? And I guess that's the ultimate question that I'm hoping to find out this year. You know, I'm gonna do a lot of miles on it, traveling on it. So we'll see. I think the question for me is, is it reliable? Now, if this proves reliable, if this bike doesn't let me down or only lets me down in little niggly ways, then I think for 4,000 pounds, how can you possibly say it doesn't offer a good value and a good, uh, reference point or, 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 or place that the adventure sector is heading to. So 
Would I have one in my garage? I've already got one in my garage. Do I regret buying it? No, I don't regret buying it. Ask me in 12 months and we'll see the, what the answer, the final answer is. So uh, many more miles ahead. The rubber feet on the Max Pannier allow better placement on uneven surfaces and protects from damaging floors. Metal Mule, engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Well, what can I say? Nathan, as always, a fabulous job. I'll uh, be getting the sack soon, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, it's time for Adventure Bike TV's People's Awards. It's time once again for the Adventure Bike TV People's Awards results. Despite a smaller number of categories this year, we have had a record amount of votes. So let's get straight to it. This year we had more options than ever for best adventure bike and every year a new bike has come out on top. This year is no different and despite it being an industry giant, this is the first time it's won the People's Awards. This year's winner of best adventure bike goes to the BMW 1200 GS. Best dealer customer service this year returns to our first ever winner of this award, it's BMW. Best retailer customer service has been won every year so far by the Adventure Bike Shop. But this year there's a change. Uh, only kidding. Once again, the Adventure Bike Shop are well-deserved winners of the award. This year we added a new award, Best Travel Journal of the Year. And people have voted. The winner, voted by the people, is Anders Yasmo. Well done to all the winners. But wait, we still have our Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, we are going to hang far on that one just for now, but keep a lookout in future episodes. Thank you so much to everybody who entered the awards and of course thank you to everybody who voted. Now it's time for Film School with Tom where he's going to be talking about how to end your film. Hello and welcome to this month's Film School. So this month we're going to be looking at how to end your film. We've already looked at how to start your film and the kind of middle section of the film that gives you the main content, but now we're going to concentrate on how to finish a film. Now we've already talked about the start and the middle of films, and every part of the process of filming is important for a different reason. As we said, the start of the film is what gets people hooked. The middle of the film is where you actually tell the majority of your story. The end, why is the end so important? Because that's the lasting thing that people take away with them. When people leave, they remember the last thing they saw. It's very similar actually to what one of my friends Rana told me when working on a film set. You can do an entire month's worth of work and be absolutely fantastic. If you muck something up on that last day, you lose a memory card or you drop something or smash it, people remember your last day, not the 29 days that came before it. So the ending is massively important. And this is also where you can decide how you want to leave your audience. Do you want to leave them questioning what they've seen? Do you want to leave them happy, excited, sad? This is where you leave that final thought, if you like. So the first thing to do when you get to the end of the film is to make sure you've answered any questions that you've posed at any point during your film. So if at the very start you say, this is where we're trying to get to. Did you actually get there? We need to know that. If you were doing a charity ride and you were hoping to raise money, did you do it? How much did you raise? You need to answer any questions that you put out at the start of the film. If you don't answer a question, make sure there's a reason. If you're leaving a question hanging in the air, make sure it, it means something. 
Make sure there's a reason. It's maybe something you want them to go away and think about themselves. But it's really important that you don't accidentally not answer questions. So how do you actually end your film? How, how do you shoot the end of your film? This is very, very difficult. Now, there are three main ways that I think that you can end quite nicely uh, a kind of travel documentary film. If you can think of a fantastic original way, then absolutely brilliant. Uh, but I have three ways that I find are safe um, and good endings to a film. So the first is what I call the off into the sunset type ending. This is where you have that really spectacular final shot. Now there is a reason that in films they go off into the sunset because the sunset signifies the end of the day and this is the end of your film. It's that symbolic gesture to the viewer saying this is ending now, this is, this is the end, this is where we're leaving it. Of course, it doesn't actually have to be riding off into the sunset. It can just be motorcycles riding away from the camera. But what you don't want to do is have, for example, uh, the bikes riding towards the camera, because that doesn't finalise anything. That says there's more to see, and that what you want to see is behind you, and we can't see that, and that's frustrating. And that can leave a viewer um, frustrated without even realising it. Uh, by making sure that someone is riding away from the camera or into something like a sunset, that is telling the viewer this is finished. Now, in terms of filming these shots, drones are a fantastic way now to do those shots because you don't have to have necessarily someone moving in camera. Instead, you have the drone moving. This can be very effectively done with just a simple pan straight up. The drone goes up and leaves below behind them uh, the riders uh, or any of the adventurers that you happen to have and it shows you a fantastic vista, something that they might be looking at um, as well as the viewer. The second way I think works quite well as an ending for a film which is a documentary film is a recap, uh, but concentrating on some of those really special moments. I tend to make sure that I try and get some people smiling or laughing, um, having fun uh, and just kind of uh, recap to everyone all the fantastic things that you've done um, and I think that works really well and it's it's a bit of a cop-out because it means you're not uh, giving necessarily a fantastic ending but you are letting people know this is what happened Do you remember this wasn't this great and that's a really nice way to end the other one I like to use if you can is outtakes now it depends whether you've actually got any good outtakes whether people have mucked up their lines when talking to camera Graham Hoskins or whether it's just you know, normal kind of dropping your bike or falling over and making a fool of yourself. But these are really nice because actually at the end of the film, people are watching and uh, they find it really endearing to see that, you know, you're human too and that you've made mistakes uh, in lots of different ways on your trip. And actually it can be quite a nice little way of, of ending. But don't just think of it as only outtakes. You know, uh, I used it in uh, Kathmandu to Dakar where it wasn't so much outtakes, but it was people smiling and laughing and, and having fun. And it was trying to show the humanity behind the people on the trip. Uh, and that works really well as well. Of course, then there are the credits. Now, the credits are not always important, but it's always nice to say who you met, who helped you out on trips, and there will always be someone who helped you out or you met along the way that you want to say thanks to, and this is a great place to do it. Now, on trips where things have happened and I've needed, a, a, it's been a TV programme or something like that, and I've needed a lot more um, time to, to put those credits on and there's because there's so many people to thank and, and supporters and things like that, then actually what you can do is sometimes have... Um, that outtake reel run alongside it. We used to do it on Adventure Bike TV. Then Graham got a bit better at presenting and suddenly uh, there weren't as many outtakes. Uh, or, for example, um, the, we talked about the video of people smiling and just that kind of almost bit behind the scenes. That works really well sometimes next to, um, next to what you're watching. The other thing you can do with credits is actually make your credits interesting. Uh, I filmed uh, the Monaco Classic Rally and I had a whole load of footage of these fantastic cars I hadn't used. So we put those in the credits and made sure that we had the credits around um, these great shots of cars that we wanted to uh, get into the film but didn't have anywhere we could particularly put it into the body of the film. So that was a really nice way of doing it too. And it means that people stay and watch till the end of the credits, which is always nice. 
I think the key thing to say is it is not easy. Just like the start of a film is not easy, it's not easy to find an original great way to end a film. Um, best thing I suggest is try your best and go with whatever feels right to you. Um, and again, try and leave an emotion with people, whether it's happy, sad, thoughtful, anything like that. But try and leave some sort of emotion with your, with your viewers. Okay, so before I go, a very quick word on the film competition. I've had quite a lot of people get in contact with the show and say it's a real shame that they can't go away uh, this summer uh, on their bike trips and make a film, bearing in mind that they want to do it for a competition and bearing in mind the stuff they've learned in this segment. So what we've actually decided to do is extend that. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to let people enter for the whole of this year, uh, any, any films they want to. And at the end of the year, for the kind of December show, we'll announce the winners and then we'll start the whole process again uh, for next year. So there'll be a, a whole year of people being able to submit their films. Please remember, though, most of the ones that we've got in so far, we can't enter because people haven't really paid attention. Um, some of them are too long. Um, some of them have no story they are just five minutes of helmet camera footage that isn't what we're looking at we're looking for a story um even if you've only got helmet camera footage just do some narration tell a story that's that's really really important that's what we're looking for uh, and also please remember that you need to not use music that is copyrighted because we can't show it if you do so Fantastic. Um, hope you enjoyed this film school segment and we'll see you next month where we're going to talk, we're going to try and talk about editing, which is, I'm not even sure how I'm going to do that yet. It's not easy, but we'll, we'll figure something out. See you then. As always, insightful and instructional, Tom, thank you very much. Now it's time for a break. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. 
Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Okay, welcome back to the show. It's time for Under the Visor. This month, it's with Kathy Wood. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. My name is Cathy Woods. I am one of the directors of Moto Freight, uh, which is a company that specialises in the international transport of vehicles around the world, specialising in motorcycles, but we do cater for all vehicles. Um, my father is Welsh, my mother is English. Uh, so I was born in South Africa, but my family history and heritage is entirely British. I don't tell many people that though. Kind of ruined that here. But, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm very proudly South African. I am very proudly South African but I'm also proudly British. So. Uh, we moved over to the UK when I was seven years old. So um, I was just, you know, it was a good time to move because I've got a younger brother as well. So it was a good time to move for us because it wasn't too uh, disconcerting for us to relocate to an English school. Uh, we actually moved to Wales first, uh, to near Bridge End. And then fairly shortly after that, we moved towards uh, Heathrow, which is where we are now. Um, I, I got my bike license before I got my car license, um, partially because the insurance was a heck of a lot cheaper on a motorcycle, but mainly because the motorcycle thing was always going to happen. Um, my dad's always ridden bikes, um, my uncle's always ridden bikes, I've always loved bikes. Uh, so as soon as I could afford lessons, um, I started paying for bike lessons and I saved up for a second-hand uh, Kawasaki Zephyr, which was my first bike. And it was only a few years after that when I had an accident and broke my femur that I got my car license because I had to be able to drive a vehicle for work and I couldn't drive a bike while, my, while I had a, um, a splint down the inside of my leg. My first job while I was at school was as a courier for a freight company on Heathrow. And I used to work weekends on my motorcycle um, couriering paperwork around Heathrow Airport. And, um, there's a particularly dangerous roundabout near the animal reception centre on the, on the airport and I had to take the last exit, which is notoriously bad because no one expects you to take it. It's quite a small exit and the one before it is quite a major um, entrance into the roundabout. And there's, I've had near accidents many times, but this time um, a car driver got the better of me and it, he didn't technically hit me. Um, but I had to take ev evasive action to avoid him because he pulled out in front of me at about 30 miles an hour. He didn't stop, he just pulled out in front of me and I was going slightly too fast to be able to stop. So I took evasive action and actually accelerated and I went round the front of him, which means I didn't get hit. It does unfortunately mean that I hit the lamppost and grip box immediately on the other side of the pavement um, and I broke my right femur and I was left lying on the floor with my bike propped up against the lamppost and the driver didn't stop, he drove off. So although we didn't make contact, it is technically a hit and run um, and we've never found out who it was. Luckily there was someone nearby who saw it happen, uh, who called an ambulance and kind of looked after me from there. Not for a second, not for an absolute second. A lot of my friends and my mother particularly assumed that would be the end of my biking days and I've never understood it, if I'm honest. I. I realise accidents are part of the risk. You know that every time you get on a bike. It's, it's part of the environment that you're in. If that's a problem, you tend not to get on one in the first place. And I've got nothing but respect for people who don't get back on a bike after a big off. There's nothing wrong with that. But for me personally, it was never an option. As soon as my leg was better and the bike was repaired, I was back on it. I get asked all the time, what, what's the biggest trip I've done or what, what's the next big trip? And because of what I do for a living, which is facilitate other people having big trips. It's actually quite difficult for me to take an extended length of time off work. Um, so what I do is what many people do. I get away for shorter periods when, when I can. Two years ago, I did a two week trip through, um, I shipped the um, bike out to Bulgaria. Um, we were testing a new um, supplier. We, we, we like to test our suppliers before we use them for customers' bikes. And uh, I spent two weeks riding back from Bulgaria and I went through Romania, Serbia, Kosovo, Bosnia and Croatia and then back through, back through kind of um, France. Um, otherwise, I mean, that, that was absolutely amazing. Every part of that was brilliant. Um, but if I can't do that, I'll get away for a weekend 
here or there. I, I went down to the Alps last year for four days with a friend, um, literally bombed it down, spent uh, three nights playing in the Alps and then bombed it back again. Um, when I can in the UK, I'll get away for a weekend or a long weekend. I'll go to Wales or the Shropshire Hills or Scotland, wherever. Um, big trips are amazing. They're absolutely fantastic. And I love that we support other people being able to do them. And I do intend to do one or two myself. But if you can't do that, if it's not the right time, you don't have the money, you, you don't have that much time off work, getting away for a short period is just, it's just as exciting. It's just as amazing. And it is just as fulfilling. Um, so for the minute, that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, I have a potential trip to Canada penciled in for 2019. I also have a potential trip to India. I've also been invited to go to Bishkek with a friend. Unfortunately, I can't fit that one in, but there are other trips potentially coming. But for the meantime, little trips here and there when, when I can get away. When, when I say big trip, I'm probably using the phrase, um, sorry, I'm probably using the phrase inaccurately because obviously a, a big trip to, to some people is a big, big trip a year plus. Um, I'm very happy with a week or two here and there. Um, I would love to do four to six weeks around South America, the northern part of South America, Colombia, Peru. I very, very much like to do that. Um, just because I think, from what I've heard of that part of the world, it's stunning and I think it deserves to be done slowly and to really appreciate everything. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't travel every day. I'd like to stop in a few places and just explore. Um, so each, each to their own. I, I can't see myself taking a year-long trip anytime soon. And I'm not entirely sure it's the right thing for me to do, at least not now. Um, but as long as I can get away here and there and just see different parts of the world, even if it's not on my bike, as long as I can travel, I don't mind. By and large, I absolutely don't see a downside. I just love it. I love working with people who are going on these trips. You get excited for them. When they deliver their bikes into you for the start of a trip, they've done the research. They, they, they're, they're really excited about what's coming and they're talking to you about all their plans and you can't help but get you know, involved and excited for them. And I love that. And it's just as good when people come back at the end of a trip um, because then now they're telling you what they actually did, which may not be what they planned to do, but you know, they've always got stories and they, they're usually good, but they might be a little bit bad, but because they're remembered with fondness, they're, they kind of turn into good. So it's, it's really, really fulfilling. What we do is absolutely amazing. Having said that, there have been a couple of days where you do just think, I would love to do what you've just done and I have to listen to you and get excited for you and I love it. And then I have to go back to my desk and carry on with paperwork and I just really want to jump on my bike and go with you. Um, as part of the fun, there are days where I don't like to say I'm jealous, I'm not a jealous kind of person, but there are days where I do think, wow, yes, I'd really like to do that. Um, by and large, it's amazing. Um, I'm actually going to learn how to paraglide this year, partially based on what a previous customer was telling me about what he was doing on his trips, and it's something I've always wanted to do. And we got chatting about it, and I got involved in this conversation with him, and he just went, well, why don't you do it? I was like, that's a damn good question and I don't know there isn't a reason so um, yeah this year I'm, I'm gonna learn to paraglide because of conversations I've had with customers so there's always a positive to take out of what we do um, basically uh, my dad started motorcycle shipping in the UK as a specialism um, he's worked in freight all his life uh, and he's he found this niche um, that he was in, exceptionally passionate about and I love bikes and I love travel and I, I loved what, what he was managing to offer to people as a specialist service. And I thought it deserved the energy and um, narrow, narrow focus that, that something that important actually deserved. I was, I was actually working with another company. I was an office manager for a, for a vehicle rental firm. Um, when we just got talking about potentially just focusing on motorcycles and vehicles and travelers and and making this a real thing just as a real specialism and we got we got talking we just said you know what let's let's make it happen let's just do it so uh, we joined forces we set up motor freight uh, five years ago um, with purely that intention to make international travel possible for anybody and everybody 
um, and that's what we work to do is bring the prices down, make the process as simple as possible and just, just make people realise that this is a possibility for you to get out there and do this on your own bike if that's what you want to do. My proudest moments with Motor Freight is, um, yeah, we have won a few industry awards which I'm exceptionally proud of and, and they're fantastic and we, we are very pleased with those. But the proudest moments of working for Motor Freight are when you help someone who's gone into trouble on the other side of the world and desperately needs to repatriate their bike back to the UK because something's going on in their life that they've had to change plans last minute and we, we have helped quite a few people like this and you're literally helping them out of a really tight spot and when they thank you for that it's 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 a really amazing feeling I mean it's you know we, we, we do this job for people as much as for anything else so when you get a sincere customer giving genuine thanks for for really working with them on something it's it's incredibly beautiful and and it's it's a bit general but helping people fulfill their dreams is absolutely amazing um i was having a bad week one uh, one week last year i was just having a bit of a tough week and a, a previous customer just said how can you possibly have a bad week you make people's dreams come true as a living and it was just the most amazing thing to hear just kind of exactly when they needed to hear it and i just thought yeah do you know what we do and that's pretty cool so there are some standalone moments, I can't mention specific customers that we've helped, um, but by and large every time a customer gives you their thanks, you know, you feel pretty good about life. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Kathy, thanks so much for doing Under the Visor with us. There's some stuff there that I didn't know about. Now it's time for Under the Visor with Dave Harrison of Moto Euro HQ YouTube channel. Welcome to our KTM in Africa twin adventure to Switzerland. Ooh, toast. Bread. Whoa. The temptation was to glue a load of footage together of us riding some passes, but that was deemed a little bit boring in the pub. So um, I've decided to make this a bit more informative. So if you're thinking of going to Switzerland on your bike, you might want to stick around going to try and tell you what we thought were the best places to stay, our favourite passes, what we thought of the bikes, all that kind of stuff. Now, before we kick this off though, I've been a very fortunate man with my motorcycle adventures. Along with my friends, we've ridden through France a few times, some Italian passes, we've done Stelvio, been lost in the Alps, been to the highest road in Europe, the Napoleon route, French Riviera, the Spanish Pyrenees, a spell in Tuscany, Austria, we've been to the Millau Viaduct and we've done the Nürburgring. In fact, yes, I've been a very lucky man. I've loved all of these motorcycling adventures. They've been fantastic. The only downside is that monotonous ride through the Netherlands and Belgium and Northern France. It's really boring. Fortunately, our KTM riding amigo Mark came up with a plan put both bikes on the back of a van. We'll then nip to the pub, have a quick goodbye beer. <laughs> Jump on the ferry and enjoy, well, you know, um, might be a tipple or two in our free room upgrade. Then we'll drive to Switzerland in a single day, missing out all the boring stuff and getting us there as quick as possible. When we arrive in Switzerland, it's time to check into the hotel, grab a quick beer and look forward to a hearty breakfast the next day. That'll be bread, a side order of bread, and some bread. Mark can barely contain his enthusiasm. On the plus side, we're staying in a beautiful village called Andermatt, which is right in the middle of the Swiss Alps, but there's no time to hang around. We've got to get the bikes off the van, get the wing mirrors and screens fitted back on, and then ride out of the village to those gorgeous Swiss passes dead ahead. And we're off. 
South of Andermatt lies the St. Gothard Pass, an excellent introduction to the Swiss Alps, long sweeping corners, good quality tarmac, but the further we ride near the top, the colder it gets. We must have lost 15 degrees by the time we get to the summit, it's freezing. But this place is beautiful and well worth a visit. The mountains and views from the top are simply breathtaking. Up next, the Nuffendnir Pass. Some idiot forgot to press record on the camera. So the best I can do for you now is this rather smart view from the top. Speaking of idiots. On both sides you've got long sweeping corners, hairpins near the top, great tarmac, you'll not be disappointed. You're not the only one out there having a little bit of fun, you've got to watch out for these guys. That happens a bit more than I'd like it to, so if you like to ride everywhere at 15,000 RPM, you're going to need your crystal ball with you. Now, you need to keep an eye out for these guys too. Apparently anything over 3-4 kilometres over the speed limit, you're up for an on the spot fine. Now, I don't know when these guys clock off, but the Alps are alive with high-end sports bikes at about 4-5 o'clock. No idea why. Anyway, back to the action, the sun's come out. Goldfinger's favourite, the Furka Pass. Definitely our favourite pass so far. Um, we might have ridden that a couple of times. Anyway, it's back to the hotel in Andermatt. We have a couple of beers and look forward to another hearty breakfast the next morning. Then it's the Grimsel Pass. We ride the Furka Pass again over to the Grimsel. Welcome to the Grimsel Pass. That is the Furka Pass. We've got a long day ahead of us. Let's get a move on. We'll add a Moda Euro sticker at the summit and grab a quick coffee. No time to hang around, we're riding down the pass towards the enormous hydro dam. Grimsel Pass Part 2. Down there. We're coming back to the Grimsel Pass soon for something very, very special. But until then, it's the Susten Pass.
do it. The Grimsel and the Sustan are quickly becoming our new favourite passes. Um, more about that a little bit later on. Now, we all know Switzerland's very expensive, but Andermatt is turning out to be crazy money. So we've decided to jump from Andermatt up the road to Wazen. We're staying in the Gerig Hotel, which is right on the Sustan Pass. Thoroughly recommended, sensibly priced and great food. You can see all these roads link up to form this magic figure of eight. If you stay anywhere around here, this is motorcycling nirvana. Anyway, we enjoy a couple of beers on the evening, wake up to a proper breakfast, <clears throat> and we're off on a fairly big day. We ride the Oberlap Pass right over to the Splugen Pass. That takes us into Italy. We ride the pass back again to the San Bernardino. We return via Luca Magno and the Oberlap to the hotel for some well-deserved beers. Whew. Compared to the bigger passes, the Oberlap seems slightly less epic, but it does have an infeasibly long tunnel carved out the mountainside, a sticker, a lighthouse and a village idiot. Fortunately, the ride down is more entertaining. The road across may be very pretty, but all these towns and villages are slowing us down when not making good time. Eventually, the mighty Splugen Pass. Think of this one as more of an adventure. The road is narrow, the tarmac is poor, and if you're after knee down sports action, you're in the wrong place. But when you get to the top, it's worth it. Italian tarmac is no better, but they are very good at stunning views. Keep your eyes open for this entertainment. These short tunnels are everywhere and they can be a little bit slippy inside. Let's just be grateful they haven't put hairpin corners in to catch you out. Oh, hang on. I'm one of those people that will get lost in his own bathroom. So it's come as no surprise that I might have um, got us a bit lost. Um, you see, I thought the Splugen Pass joined up to the San Bernardino Pass. Um, it doesn't. It's not even close. 10,000 years of cartography wasted on me. What this means is we have to ride the Splugen Pass all the way back, down the other side of course, pick up the correct road to get towards the San Bernardino Pass where normal service is resumed. The road surface is far better, but it's no wider, yet the San Bernardino Pass is still fun to ride. Not sure what these buildings are, probably something to do with water because there's boatloads of it at the top and it's teeming with fish. We add a sticker to the sign and then Mark jumps ahead we're really short of time now, and if we're not back before 8.30 to the hotel, we'll go hungry. We've still got the Luca Magno Pass to ride before we even get close. We're really losing the light now. Best I can do for you is this photograph. We're in a bit of a hurry because we want to get to the hotel, and unbelievably, I don't even know how we've done this, we actually make it back in time to order food and enjoy those well-deserved beers. We're having serious psychological issues over breakfast. <laughs> Mark's now eating bum bread. <laughs> Today we're going in the opposite direction. We ride over the Susten Pass down to the Simplon Pass. This takes us back into Italy.
At the bottom of the Simplon Pass, there's a military checkpoint security border thing, so no cameras, no video. We parked up there and walked about 50 yards down the road. That's where that restaurant is. Next door to that, there's a shop. Now, if you're after some cheap wine, that's very good. You're in the right place. Take your top box with you or a backpack. Uh, fill up with cheap cigarettes and then get yourself back into Switzerland. You'll save a fortune. Right, we're coming to the end of our adventure to Switzerland. In fact, it's our last day. Anyway, I promised you something very special at the Grimsel Pass. Now, I got talking to a couple of Swiss cyclists. They told me about this place. It's quite quiet. There are certainly no motorcycles. They described it as one of the most beautiful places in the whole of the Alps. If you're riding the Grimsel Pass, you might want to stick around for this. Mark's been trying to find somewhere we could ride off-road for our final day, but for the moment we're riding to the top of the Grimsel Pass. Our cyclist friends tell us to keep an eye out for a traffic light. We take a few minutes to enjoy the view. And just round the corner, we found it. That traffic light only changes once every hour. This is the road to Obera. Welcome to the Oberra Glacier. I wish I could find our cycling friends to thank them. It turns out they were right. My GoPro didn't do that much justice. You'll see when you're there. Now, Mark's been looking at the map, trying to sort out a bit of off-roading before we go home. Nothing too serious, just a bit of a laugh. Proving to be a bit more difficult than we thought, but eventually his perseverance has paid off. to relax and have a late lunch. Oh, for God's sake. At the hotel, we use the evening to pack up. Yeah, sort of. In the morning, we load the van up with our bikes, our cases, we say our goodbyes, hit the road, and when we board the ferry, that signals it's time for a quick beer, followed by a beer, and uh, you get the idea. Before you can say what's for breakfast, we're back home. 
Oh, for f If you're still here, I admire your stamina. You've probably worked out which was our favorite pass. In terms of the bikes, not really a great deal of difference between the two, to be honest. They both performed really well. Um, <laughs> there is a level of irony here, though. Mark is a much taller man than I am. Um, and my Africa Twin is a much taller bike than his KTM. Perhaps we should have... Um, never mind. Before I go, a couple of shout outs, very important. Firstly, I'd like to thank my brother John. He was supposed to come on this trip, but sadly had to pull out. Nevertheless, he made an enormous effort to come to the pub for a goodbye beer and brought with him a bag of nibbles we could have on our road trip. And to Steve for bringing his young family to Tynemouth to wave us off. The boys are out there somewhere. I'd like to thank Mark not only for his amazingly comfortable air-conditioned van, but being brutally honest, this trip wouldn't have happened without him. Most importantly, I'd like to thank my wife. Not just for this trip, but for missing out on countless holidays because Monkey Boy here wanted to go away on his motorbike. That's it guys, we're done. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for your company and thank you for watching. Hope you've spotted the clues to our next big adventure, but there'll be a lot more videos to come before that. Your very good health. There's another glass of that and a hot bath with my name written all over it. See you later. Well, that was the show. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next month, hopefully, with some warmer weather and, of course, top riding tips.